Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Awareness Speaker Series hosted by the Equity Office and the Human Rights Committee of Council. The keynote today is entitled Navigating Norms, Supporting International Students and Newcomers in the Workplace with Brian Rochon. I'd like to begin by gratefully acknowledging that we are in Treaty One territory, the home and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Inanu and Dakota peoples, and in the national homeland of the Red River Métis. Our clean drinking water comes from Show Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty Three territory. The land and water acknowledgement is an important part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action it's a powerful gesture demonstrating respect for the Indigenous peoples as rights holders, their histories and their traditional lands where we all work and live benefiting from these resources. I want to also let everyone know that the City of Winnipeg is recording this session for educational purposes. Questions posed by participants are included on what is recorded. This collection of personal information is authorized under the Section 361B of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and will be used for continued informational and educational purposes. It will not be used or disclosed for any other purposes unless required or permitted by law. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the Corporate Access and Privacy Officer at the City. A recording of today's event will be made available available on both CityNet and the Winnipeg.ca websites. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask today, you can submit it by using the Q&A in the Zoom webinar event. You can choose to ask it anonymously by making sure to select that option before clicking send. We will make every effort possible to address all questions during our time here today. To turn on the closed captions, select more captions, English and show captions. Within captions, you can also adjust caption settings to best suit your needs. If at any time you lose connection to this event, just please use the same link to rejoin. So thanks for joining us today and I'll now turn it over to Bradley West, manager of the equity office to introduce Brian Rashad. You're muted, Bradley. All right. It helps if you unmute yourself, correct? So welcome, everybody. Happy 2024. If you celebrate and follow the Gregorian calendar, um, if you are following the lunar calendar, we're still um, in that move up to the new year. Glad to have you all with us today. And we are in for a treat. I have had the incredible pleasure personally and professionally of knowing Brian, working alongside of him for many years now in a variety of roles that have intersected with the newcomer sector, focusing on a human rights lens when it looks at equity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging. So some information that you need to know about Brian, he's going to do a much better job of introducing himself later on, but we want to be able to let you know that you... Brian has both lived personal experience, professional experience, and academic experience that he brings to this work. A born and raised in another country, he was an international student. Um, he immigrated to Canada with his family as a child, then went abroad and then came back home here to Canada, built a home here. Uh, he works in the sector in a variety of different capacities. He sits on several committees, including International Education Committee of Cooperative Education and Work Integrated Learning Canada, the Canadian Bureau for International Education's Intercultural Skills Working Group, FutureWorks, which is an employability skills assessment tool, and College Working Group Immigration Partnership Winnipeg Employment Sector Roundtable, and is currently employed in Red River College Polytechnic, working with inter workplace integrated learning. We are incredibly grateful that Brian has agreed to share his expertise and experience with us. There will be an opportunity at the end of the presentation to ask questions. 
please uh, follow the instructions and drop those off into the chat. I'm now going to hand it over to Brian, and we will see you after his presentation. Thank you very much. And now, off to you, Brian. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, nice introduction. I couldn't have done it any better myself, so I will probably not even attempt to do so. Um, is everyone seeing my screen now? I've, I've just uh, launched the share here. Uh, thumbs up or um, some visual confirmation would be great. I'm assuming it is. So thank you. This was yeah. um, rooted in my, my research that I did for graduate studies. Um, so it, it may come off a little bit academic, um, for which I apologize. But um, I'll try to uh, kind of get through everything and contextualize this more with the discussion and focus of what you can do within a workplace, um, within hiring, onboarding, management, whatever your respective roles are, or advocation um, if you're within the community um, to support newcomers and, and international students a little more effectively through the lens of intercultural discovery and development. Um, so I wanted to begin with uh, just a pulse check and um, just talking about some key terms here, specifically around unconscious bias. And in doing so, recognizing that we all carry within us intrinsically um, worldviews and perceptions of how we see the world. Um, those are based largely on our lived experiences, and it's very natural. So when we when we talk about terms like bias, um, blind spots, um, they, they don't necessarily need to be associated with negative connotations. I know it's easy to feel that way at times, and certainly through my own pulse checks um, and reflexivity that goes into research or work that I'm doing, these are things I'm also mindful of. And at times, you know, w whenever I do commit any faux pas or um, something that um, um, manifests not knowing something or basically not knowing what I don't know, um, that can be a little, there can be a little bit of discomfort with that. Where, where I really want to focus attention, though, is primarily on recruitment and selection. Um, I'm sure that all of you who have worked within the context of hiring um, or supporting selection processes or have who have applied for opportunities and you know been convinced that you nailed it and been perfect for a position have likely experienced some false negatives and false positives, which which we know occur. Um, and that there is on it, there is some evidence that there certainly can be affinity bias that that occurs within these processes. Um, again, just going back to seeing the world and understanding the world through our own perspectives, and then in in turn unconsciously or subconsciously applying that through our selection processes as well, or what we might perceive in terms of fit, what is appropriate fit for a position. So uh, I'd like you to think about biases and blind spots. Um, in other words, we know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. And um, yeah, please ask questions. Um, hopefully this is relevant. And if you'd like to get in touch with me later on to further discuss any of this um, or explore some opportunities, my contact information will be shared again at the end. So um, as I mentioned, this was rooted within postgraduate research that, that I conducted at the University of Saskatchewan um, as a grad student, and then here in, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, in terms of where I worked with um, participants um, and conducted the research and analysis. But to provide context to that and where this came from, uh, as was mentioned, I was born outside of Canada um, in a small country currently called Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland. Um, which is in Southern Africa. Um, after living in a few countries in the continent of Africa, mostly South and Central, uh, my family came to Canada. Uh, I have connections to Canada through my mother. And I uh, had the opportunity in high school, which I'm clearly going to date myself on admitting this, um, to study in quite recent, what was quite recent post-apartheid South Africa. So those of you who know your history, this was in the 90s. Uh, mid 90s. And I had the opportunity to go and study there as an outbound international student, uh, where I was a boarder. Um, I completed a few years of high school in South Africa, and uh, ultimately came back to Canada. But it was through those experiences where I first um, started to really appreciate, understand and think about intercultural learning and development and cultural dimensions in terms of shaping differences and values. 
um, ways of perceiving and understanding and engaging with the world and how those manifest in different study habits, different learning styles, um, different teaching styles, and also in different expectations and norms related to workplace behaviors. Um, there's a few um, uh, educational and, and research-based uh, terms that are provided here for you to be aware of. So I will be talking a little bit about human and social capital theory. There's a reference there for you. And also this research was really about applying Hofstede's framework for cultural dimensions to a qualitative study. Um, I also worked in education for the past decade. And before joining Red River College Polytechnic, I was at Manitoba Institute of Trades and Technology, where I worked with cohorts that were exclusively international students. And so what I'd often find when I was doing that work and putting together lesson plans is they just weren't landing in terms of what I was expecting as an instructor. I wasn't getting the type of engagement that I was expecting. And after a lot of analysis and research, I realized that this was predominantly rooted within ethnocentric reasoning. I was putting together lesson plans um, that I felt would be effective for learners like myself um, and that were very much rooted within cultural and, let's face it, colonial constructs that exist within Western and Canadian systems of education. I wasn't putting together plans that were accounting for students' preferences for learning, learning styles, and the educational norms and behaviors that had been embedded within them. And, and so through a lot of trial and error and experiments, um, this, this research started to come together through my own work um, in, in action research as an instructor, and then academically when I was putting together and conceiving this plan. Um, so here's just some numbers for you to, to contextualize the importance of this or what, why I believe that this is a really important topic. Um, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of information and a lot of uh, perspectives that have been shared in the news lately around immigration and international students. Uh, I'm, I'm of the belief that newcomers and international students have always played an important part in shaping Canadian uh, society and supporting economic growth and development and helping organizations maximize their potential within a global marketplace. We're currently at about 900,000 international students in Canada, um, for your reference. And um, like, again, statistically, within the next decade, um, uh, at least... 30% of Canada's population will be comprised of immigrants um, or, you know, second generation Canadians, if you want to look at it that way. Either way, intercultural skills, intercultural awareness and various perspectives, I think, will have significant impacts um, within business, how we do business, how we conduct and leverage those perspectives. So that's really where all this came from. Um, when newcomers come to a new country, I believe that we have a responsibility um, when we're admitting people from different parts of the world to ensure that we have the right systems and supports in place, just as we have a responsibility um, for all addressing all aspects of inequality um, within society. Um, this is something that I see a lot within education, and I'm fortunate to be part of an institution that takes those commitments and others uh, very serious. Um, but it's something that I think we should all be a little more mindful of is, is sort of that shared responsibility that we have. And this is a model I really like um, developed by Marilyn Clark. And um, it looks at the determinants of individual employability. So um, we have human capital, which is really a culmination of what we might refer to as KSAOs, knowledge, skills, abilities, and attributes. A lot of these are learned academically. Um, so their hard skills are what we might perceive as hard skills or technical skills. Um, social and cultural capital, we know are really important. Um, many of you probably are familiar with statistics related to the hidden job market. So uh, most estimates are putting that somewhere at 80 percent. Um, and this is something where a lot of newcomers and people that belong to marginalized communities experience significant inequalities in access to social networks and capital. Um, learning about jobs. Um, I know that right now a lot of recruiters um, are being a lot more conscientious about where and how they share information and ensuring that they're reaching uh, everyone or reaching um, reaching candidates from a more equitable perspective. 
Um, but it's still something that needs to be addressed and something we focus a lot on in the work that I do is ensuring that we're integrating a lot of networking and, and social supports to connect students with opportunities or newcomers with opportunities. We also know within this is it can be challenging because a lot of a lot of the time newcomers come from backgrounds where their educational qualifications and work experience aren't recognized or those credentials aren't recognized. And ultimately, one of the other things that's not really spoken about is the cultural aspect, having that understanding and awareness of cultural expectations and cultural norms. So when we talk about things like employability fit um, or the types of competencies we're looking for in candidates, again, that's coming from a specific culture place that's linked to cultural norms and behaviors. And those are socially and culturally constructed. And they're also manifests of the colonial legacy. Um, I'll speak a lot more about these at length, but I think what's key here is how we perceive employability, how we perceive candidates. Um, and that's often something that could be really challenging for a lot of newcomers going into opportunities that they might otherwise be well qualified for, have a lot of experience in, but aren't being perceived as being employable, employable or suited. And, and these, again, I'll, I'll speak to at length uh, in a moment here. Um, so the research itself, um, as I mentioned, was looking at applying some of Hofstede's cultural dimensions or seeing whether there was some efficacy within those in a qualitative study. Um, the guiding questions are outlined for you. So really looking at how students come to discover cultural differences, transition and adapt to international education, and also looking at the perspective of instructors and support staff as well to balance those out. Um, I applied a constructivist paradigm. So that basically presumes that I believe that knowledge is co-created or co-constructed, um, says a little bit about my epistemological assumptions that go into this. Um, and then I utilized an explorative case study, which are proven to um, develop social supports or can be effective in establishing social supports, which is something I felt that was important. Um, what I really wanted to do and was hopeful of was to overcome some limitations within previous studies. There has been a lot of studies around intercultural um, discovery and development, cultural differences within education, but often they are situated within um, singular groups, so students, for example, from a particular country or within a particular program. And what I wanted to do was involve students from a number of different countries and cultures and a number of program areas to determine whether some of the findings could be generalized and applied more broadly. So I had a really good sample of 20 international students from 11 countries and 11 different programs. Um, those countries spanned from Asia to South America, the Caribbean, and Middle East, and the programs were quite diverse as well, uh, encompassing business, IT, engineering, social and community development, early childcare education, and others. Uh, and then I applied a thematic analysis to the data. And what came about through that was four key findings. Um, students discussed adapting to reduce power distance, both within educational, social, societal, and workplace contexts, as well as increased individualism as a social norm. Uh, the importance of friendships and social support, supports was, was something that emerged quite clearly, uh, as was self-efficacy in English as an additional language. And I'll present some of those findings with you and, and speak about them more within the context of workplaces and then get into some of your questions. So if you're unfamiliar with the term power distance, uh, it refers to the extent to which individuals within a society accept and expect that power is distributed unequally. Um, there's a lot of historical context in this. So for example, if you look at the lines here, you'll notice that um, a lot of those countries that are at the bottom of that or lower power distance are um, have close links to Great Britain. And of course, historically, this would stem from things like Magna Carta and Protestantism and other things um, that factor in over time. Um, whereas uh, what you see within the higher power distance uh, dimensions here, pretty much includes every country where newcomers are coming to Canada. 
Um, and there's not necessarily, I don't want to look at this in terms of good or bad or anything like that, but, you know, how we assess these and judge these, again, would be based on our own lived experiences and what's normal and natural to us. But there's very clear ways in which we see this dimension manifests within education and within workplace structures. I think the most pronounced is around communication and relationships with managers, instructors, and teachers. So what we find is that within high power distance cultures, um, people are generally less inclined to ask questions of their supervisor and manager. There's sometimes a perception of, you know, fear of whether it's the right question. Um, this probably relates to not having open door policies and communication being delivered from the top to, top to the bottom, um, more hierarchy within organizations and structures, so more layers of supervision and clear orders of rank and importance. So really um, valuing titles and, and valuing the inherent power that comes from those titles. Um, within education, again, this the, this may come up. Uh, and when I was an instructor, I would often perceive things as lack of engagement. Um, you know, why aren't people asking questions? They can't be engaged then, or you know, aren't paying attention, or maybe aren't interested. And I think that these are often misconceptions. So a lot of what we perceive as behavior um, is it, probably are often rooted within cultural norms and value systems. And I believe that that's really the first step to creating equitable and inclusive workplaces and, and also more effective, efficient and inclusive workplaces as well, where we can really maximize individual talents and, and team talents. Um, so other ways, other things we want to keep in mind here is that there are differences between hierarch hierarchical and egalitarian learning and work cultures. Um, Canada is quite egalitarian, and we can look at that from the perspective of how organizations are structured. They're flatter. Um, there's more team-based outcomes and KPIs that are embedded within workplace processes. And within hierarchical organizations, there's more of that clear distinction between authority, rank and file, communication flowing from the top down, clear instructions that are given to subordinates, um, and less autonomy. And so when that's something that's that's you're you're accustomed to, um, and we don't include information that spells it out, it can be very difficult to adjust to. We know that cultural norms shape values um, or reinforce values which shape learning styles and working styles. Um, culture is something that we learn at a very young age through our parents and our extended families and our caregivers. It's reinforced and shaped through educational systems. Um, and by the time we graduate and start working, it almost becomes unconscious and automatic behavior. So it does take a lot of time for newcomers to identify these differences and really understand the root cause of how these differences um, are developed and, and how to uh, maybe identify and practice some of the behaviors that are more conducive to some of our cultural norms and requirements that we might be looking for. Um, I'll move on here because there's other information I wanna to get to you. So I really like this graph. It was taken from LaRoche and Yang's Danger and Opportunity which is a Canadian book, um, if you're looking for a good read, or if you've never had the pleasure of hearing Lionel Roach speak, I recommend it. And what it depicts is that in hierarchical cultures and organizations, um, there's a lot less people with tertiary qualifications. That's one of the key things here. So Canada has the highest percentage of people between ages of 25 and 30 with post-secondary education out of any OECD country. And what that means is that when you have more, more and more people with the same educational qualifications, candidates need to distinguish themselves on other factors. So in other countries, um, particularly a lot of the countries where our students are coming from and many newcomers might be coming from, there's less people with those same educational qualifications. And this means that when people go for job opportunities, they're assessed primarily on their educational qualifications and then are placed in a suitable positions or vacancies. Um, there's more generalization of knowledge than there is specialization of knowledge, if you want to look at it through that context. Um, but what we find is that particularly within Canada, we have an expectation and we tend to assess soft skills and technical skills um, 
uh, that are a little more equal in terms of their relative importance. If you look at most job descriptions, um, you'll see within those specifications and details, there's often a lot of soft skills that are listed as well. And where most of our international students are coming from, they're coming from contexts in which technical skills are ranked as far more important. And again, those have a lot to do with the organizational structure, culture, and other details that we can unpack if there's time permitting uh, when we get closer to the end. But key thing I wanted to emphasize here is really those differences in terms of what candidates expect and what people are um, trained for and come to understand as they're integrating within those labor markets. Um, and what recruiters are looking for as well. Those can be vastly different. So one of the other key findings had to do with increased individualism. Um, you can see that Canada overall is quite individualistic, um, one of the most individualistic cultures in the world. We don't have to look too far back in recent history to see this emphasized and demonstrated. Um, if you look at some of the protests that emerged during the pandemic, for example, in places like Canada and New Zealand, these were very much about individual rights. They weren't about collective responsibilities or collective um, impacts. And that just kind of reinforces and validates that. So individualism as a definition um, tends to refer to people where there are societies in which ties between individuals are a little more loose. The emphasis is on ensuring the protection and security of oneself and one's immediate family. Whereas when we contrast that with collective cultures, it's more we oriented. There's more of an emphasis on extended family, on in-group membership that is sometimes based on tribalism, um, sometimes religion, and sometimes extended clanship within a much broader um, definition of family and kinship. Um, and again, by the way, this is the norm in the world. Um, collective orientation is the norm. Individualism is more the exception. So these have also significant impacts when we think about it from the perspective of recruitment and selection and candidate assessments. Um, I'll talk about those momentarily. But just a few things here, as I mentioned, when we think about it within the context of recruitment and selection, um, in Canada, people start working at a younger age. Um, so usually, you know, on average, I would say it's common for teenagers to start working part time in high school. Um, I spoke with a lot of participants uh, that would that would say that in their countries, people usually wouldn't start their first job till after university or sometimes even grad school, depending on their economic and social privilege. And I think that that really summarizes and speaks to the, the experience of the majority of newcomers that are able to come here through social and economic privilege. Um, obviously, if we look at like refugees, for example, there would be some differences there in terms of those lived experiences. Um, so that's one thing to factor in. People start working at a younger age and start earning pocket money um, and start learning and adjusting to some of the professional and workplace expectations that get reinforced um, through individualistic orientation and value systems. Um, but if we look more closely at application documents, targeted resumes, cover letters don't exist in most other parts of the world. In fact, in most places outside of Canada, the United States, and I guess Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, people aren't using cover letters or have never developed a cover letter before. Um, application documents tend to be in the function of CVs, which are much more generalized um, more often than not, um, rather than specialized targeted resumes. Um, so we know that when we're looking at, for example, targeted resumes, we expect that candidates are targeting and demonstrating how they meet the specific requirements of the job. Whereas when we contrast that to other parts of the world where CVs are more common or that are more collective oriented, high power distance, um, a generalized CV works just fine. And the same document can be used to apply to different jobs because it's more about the employer understanding the qualifications and looking at what's available to find the appropriate uh, place to um, offer a position or to see where someone may belong. Um, and that just doesn't happen here. So that's, again, that's something that's really challenging. A lot of the students I work with that are 
from Canadian cultural backgrounds struggle with resumes and cover letters. So amplify that to imagine how difficult it is for a lot of newcomers. Um, I question whether a cover letter is really necessary at all. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure some of you have strong opinions on that as well, but um, speaking broadly and universally, I, I kind of sometimes question that as well. Anyway, we can come back to that. But what I really wanted to emphasize here is that these are primarily cultural differences, or they can be looked at through cultural differences as well. Um, the same would be true about how we assess performance. Um, so when you, when you come from a more collective oriented culture, um, you may, you know, spend a lot more of your time or some of your time supporting other people um, within your department or supporting some of your friends or members of in-group uh, communities. Um, performance management may happen differently. You might want more feedback. Um, that's certainly something we see more commonly with newcomers and international students is they benefit more from direct feedback and from more direction, at least in the early stages of employment, whereas we expect that often individuals can take more, have more autonomy, take more initiative. And these values are very much rooted within, or how we define these rather, are very much rooted within our cultural understanding. And those also differ when we think about things like soft skills, um, whether that's initiative, accountability, time management, teamwork, or other constructs, they will have very different meanings when you look at and view them from different cultures. But one of the other key findings related to the importance of finding friends and social supports. Um, a, a lot of participants that I interviewed spoke to the fact that they feel like Manitoba's slogan is a bit of a scam, um, that Manitobans did not appear as friendly as advertised. Um, they found that it was very difficult sometimes within educational and workplaces to distinguish friends from colleagues, and that there was often some fakeness embedded in those relationships. So for example, people that come from more collective cultures, um, particularly people I interviewed from South America would often say that it's very easy or much easier for them to distinguish if someone genuinely wants to be a friend um, in their home countries versus someone just being polite because of workplace norms and values, but having no inclination or interest in a friendship outside of work. Um, so that idea of collegiality maybe gets a little bit muddled and, and can be a little bit confusing. And it's not to say these are negative things, but I think it's all part of that cultural adjustment that people um, go through as part of their integration. Um, we also can refer this a little bit to looking at it through the lens of collectivism. So as I mentioned, coming from collectivist cultures, there's more we orientation. There's more of an understood and implied membership within a broader and extended in-group. Um, sometimes that means that your friendships are predetermined in the sense that you're born into these extended and connected units through extended family, through religious affiliation, through economic privilege, whatever. Um, whereas we do find that one of the phenomenons that people experience here is establishing friendships that are based more on those common interests or more of those individualistic aspects. Um, so I think what we see educationally and in workplaces, sometimes people will lament this. Um, I've certainly spoke to other instructors when I was teaching, and I've spoke to managers about this, about silos of newcomers that form, you know, their groups and maybe don't communicate, communicate in a different language or um, uh, don't necessarily um, integrate or have trouble, you know, working well or advocate for one another, for example. And these are very natural. Um, these are, again, rooted a lot in cultural values or cultural dimensions. Um, going back to power distance, um, what was an aha moment for me in this research was one of our a few students shared that it's it's they they for them where they're coming from in high power distance context need to have a really good reason to approach a manager or a teacher or sometimes even go to a bank, um, and the result is they sometimes over explain, whereas um, or or come in groups to demonstrate that it's more than one person that has that problem. And I think when I when we see these as managers and instructors, it's easy to misinterpret that behavior. We we see it as 
maybe, you know, someone advocating for another person or someone lacking the confidence or not understanding why this is happening in a group or not needing the over explanation. Maybe someone's not being honest with us because of all of these details that are provided. But these are very common. And, and there's certainly things I've seen a lot as an instructor, where when I was hearing these anecdotally from students, they made a lot of sense and a lot of light bulbs went out. Um, but what's really key here is to understand that part of cultural integration and learning um, is founded on informal learning. And that is the more that we can support newcomers with establishing connections within the community, the more successful they are in integrating and adapting to that community. And as a byproduct, informally learning about cultural nuances and differences um, and making those discoveries and feeling more supported, having better mental health, having better wellness. Um, this is a quote I love. One of our participants brought this up in the first focus group, um, word for words, and it kind of came up a few times. I think it speaks perfectly to how challenging and frustrating it can be when you're working and learning a different language that's not your birth language, translating thoughts from one, verbalizing them in the other. Um, again, I know when we assess candidates based on verbal communication or on written communication, we're not necessarily always accounting for those other competencies that are hidden, global perspectives, um, translation, um, the ability to think in you know, different contexts and work within different contexts. There's so many others that we could add to this, but what's key here in terms of the experience is that language barriers amplify other barriers. And so a lot of people from other parts of the world might be coming from contexts where there's more taboo um, around mental health and stigma. Um, it might not be something people are thinking about or talking about or as comfortable addressing and discussing within the workplace. So there could be other things going on that we wanna be attentive to. Uh, in our staff news today, we, we, we were just notified of uh, Bell's Let's Talk um, and to share that. And I know that there's going to be a lot of students that have just come and this is their first semester and, and they won't really understand necessarily what that means or might not yet feel comfortable reaching out. So I think the more that we can do to support self-efficacy and language learning, recognize it, create opportunities for connectivity, social supports, um, again, the more inclusive, uh, equitable and supportive our workplaces and cultures are going to be. Um, so there are a few implications um, for job seekers and recruiters. Uh, we, we've talked about some of these already, but I'll summarize them. So having less access to networks to identify and leverage meaningful opportunities, um, whether those are co-ops or career opportunities, um, is something that we should be mindful of. Um, and if you're a recruiter, I, I urge you to think about ways that you can engage on campus um, to connect with newcomers or international students, as well as other community organizations and groups. The big one for me is, is the familiarity with targeted resumes um, that is appealing to the Canadian labor market. Um, something that we work a lot at educationally and are always um, looking to provide further supports. But let's face it, it's tough. Uh, I think that even most of us are discovering ways that we can include you know, updates and improve our application documents. Um, another one, and I think that this is universal, is that soft skills may not reflect Canadian workplace cultural norms. Um, and if we're not aware of those norms and aware of why they exist, how they manifest and take shape, then I think it's important to spend some time thinking about that and, and maybe looking at ways that we can be more inclusive or supportive, whether that's through onboarding and orientation, or one of my favorites through team-based mentorship, which I'll speak to you uh, momentarily. Uh, and then, yeah, just be aware of blind spots and intercultural biases, um, that those may be um, something we, we might see those through job descriptions, specifications, and details, um, or they may come up in screening. Um, they may come up through false negatives in recruitment and selection. They could come up through um, performance management and even terminations in the workplace for things that tend to be or stem from cultural differences, um, first and foremost. The model that I constructed uh, through the data analysis. Um, uh, so it's uh, it, it it depicts the interconnection um, and interdependence between some of these concepts: uh, power distance, individualism, 
uh, social supports and, and efficacy in language learning. Um, it shows a little bit about um, the relevancy. So where we tend to um, where we tend to find the emphasis, whether it's in relationships with others, um, the experience of the individual or experience of the self, confidence, comprehension, or an in-group and out-group. Um, and then the innermost quadrant or innermost square looks at some ways that where we ultimately want to get to are some ways in which we could strengthen and support um, these uh, this understanding in a way that's uh, beneficial to newcomers and, and potentially all employees. Um, again, the one I would add uh, next to teamwork would also be mentorship as well. So as, as, as a really quick summary, um, some of my recommendations are outlined here. Um, for recruiters, hiring managers, and um, allies within a workplace, um, the first one would be to recognize cultural norms, values, blind spots, and biases. Um, review job descriptions and, and just think about are they culturally inclusive uh, and, and or responsive? Um, how are you participating in hiring and recruitment? Um, how are you partnering with communities? Um, where are there opportunities to enhance intercultural awareness and training and skills within your workplace? And a, a big one here, and, and one I'm a big fan of, is to adopt and support mentorship programs, especially team-based. And the reason I advocate strongly for team-based is because when people come from high power distance contexts, um, it can be challenging to understand and embrace an open door policy with a manager. Despite the best intentions and training the manager may have, that individual may not yet feel comfortable with that. Um, they might be worried about asking the wrong questions, um, might be unfamiliar with those processes, and it may take time to establish. Whereas when you assign mentorship and support from people working within a team unit and maybe in parallel positions, you right away remove that power um, from the equation. So people often feel more comfortable asking questions without concern of, is this the right or wrong question? Am I gonna be judged based on it? Um, so you're getting more support that way, but it's also a great way for organizations to practice inclusivity um, and, to, and to develop internal leadership competencies. Um, within their organization or department. So it's a great way for employees that want to get engaged with leadership or build their competencies to have the opportunity to do so. Uh, and then I also have some recommendations outlined for students and newcomers, um, some things that um, they can focus on, which um, primarily around familiarizing and understanding the Canadian market, being mindful of their own norms, values, blind spots and biases, um, the relative importance of technical and soft skills, just being resilient because it can be really frustrating and take time. And of course, leveraging uh, opportunities uh, and connections. So I know we're nearly there. I'm sure that there's some questions. Um, my information's here. So if anyone would like to reach out to me or connect with me to explore opportunities for training in your workplace, your organization, um, or just to have a conversation about anything that you're experiencing or are looking at improving related to intercultural discovery, development, competencies, um, be it onboarding, orientation, mentorship, uh, recruitment, or otherwise, please reach out. Love to have these conversations. I'm working on some publications that I would be happy to share as well, but uh, happy to take your questions here also. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, really enjoyed it. Reminded me so much of my experiences when I first immigrated to this country. Um, like many people, I came with an education background that was not recognized here. And I struggled for the first two to five years to understand uh, how to operate and be successful in the Canadian landscape. I'd never been fired from a job until I moved to Canada. Um, I'd always been the rock star performer or the successful candidate. And I had worked successfully in um, expat situation with global companies and regional offices. And so I had mistaken the ease in which it would be for me to be able to integrate into either the Canadian economy, assuming similarity, right? And I was like, well, they were colonized by the French and the English. Yeah. You know, I grew up in a country colonized by the English. This ought to translate easier than working, say, in India or in Southeast Asia. And the opposite was true. And I was then thinking, 
fast forward decades later as an instructor having international students in my class with students who had come from the Canadian system. And then also on the flip side, working student support services at Red River College and, and seeing some of the, the frustrations. I remember um, connecting with a group of international students, you know, just checking in to see how things were going, their six month check in and ask, you know, how was it going? And we'd already had a bit of a relationship so that they understood it was safer for them to bring those questions forward because we understood about power distance and everyone was quiet. No one asked a word, you know, and I shared a little bit of my own experience as, as a newcomer to break the ice and people laughed. And then I'd said, well, what's one of the things that surprised you the most? And the student raised her hand and uh, she was from um, collectivist culture. And she said, I'm really shocked at how lazy teachers are here. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. Tell me a little bit about that. Like, what do you mean by that? Lazy. She said, they're always asking the students, what do you think? What do you think? Tell me what you think. Here's a question. What would you do? And she's like, here, what I would like you to do is do your job. Teach me. You teach me what to know. You show me. You tell me what you think. She said, I'm paying a lot of money. She said, wait more than other people. Why are they so lazy? And I was like, oh, interesting. Again, yeah, this collectivist culture, not collectivist culture, but how where we often assign what we are experienced and um, used to as better. So going down to that first question of where, from an academic lens, we're very clear, you know, from equity lens, we're not talking about good or bad. We're talking about, you know, preferences and how things happen. Yet so many times, a part of that BS, that blind spot, that bias is that we do assign a, a, a thing of like, well, people who do it like us are better, right? That affinity process. Yeah. We, 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 I mean, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, educationally, speaking for education, um, but we know what happens in the workplace as well. We, we often take a deficit centered approach to working with newcomers um, rather than a strengths or asset based approach, right? That's one thing. Um, the other thing is that educational systems in a lot of other parts of the world are teacher centric. So looking at it from a high power distance um, dimension perspective, it's often perceived as knowledge being something that's being imparted. Um, and, and therefore, it would be disrespectful to question that knowledge, um, whereas we um, sort of encourage students to ask questions, because I always say this to instructors, the simplest thing you can do is simply explain why you teach the way you do and relate it to the labor market, right? You want students to engage because they're going into workplaces where communication needs to be multi-directional. Um, you want them asking questions. You want them sharing thoughts. When you're working in smaller, more egalitarian structures, you have team-based KPIs. You need people contributing, right? Versus yeah. those individual directives um, and supervision. But that's not explained. And so exactly. if it's not explained and you're just assuming that people will pick up on it, um, we're doing a disservice. So that's what I usually say. I get instruct instructors and and. Um, uh, folks within academia will ask me, you know, what what would be one recommendation that's actionable and simple? And I say, that's the simplest. Just take 10 or 15 minutes at the start of each term and maybe, you know, every few lessons to reinforce this is how I teach, this is why I teach, and this is, you know, this is, this is how it's going to benefit you um, with the objective being to prepare you for the labor market. Absolutely. And I think getting to that understanding with your students, um, one of the great pieces of advice that was passed on to me when working with, you know, mixed market students, whether they're international coming from the Canadian landscape, a lot of international students do want to stay um, here and work here and immigrate here, but some do not. And yeah. so it's letting them know, like, you know, if you're wanting to stay and integrate into the workplace, this is how this is relevant. If you're going back home and you're mm -hmm. going to work with international communities, or a multinational, this is how it's relevant so that they don't sort of like shut off or wonder where this is coming from. And you went beautifully to where I was wanting you to go in terms of how we operationalize this. One of the areas I'd like maybe you speak a little bit about is how this shows up with onboarding, because I've been you know, yeah. part of many onboarding processes where we go through lots of information really fast. And then we say, if you have any questions, ask us. But as you had showed in white power distance, the threshold of asking a question to a supervisor or someone in a position of power is yeah. quite high. And yeah. oftentimes 
would you feel like that they wouldn't feel safe in that space to ask those questions and may not bring them forward? Yeah. So how can we hold that more intentionally forward for those of us who are doing onboarding? Yeah, great question. And 100%, um, I agree with that. Um, so, uh, you know, again, just, just referring to, to the data research and the anecdotal information I received through this, um, it was clear just that that student said, they're worried about asking the wrong question. Um, that was a con. There's that constant fear about: is this the right question? Uh, you know, is, am, am I asking the right question? Is it the wrong question? I don't want to. You know, I don't want to um, convey that I don't know anything. Right? I don't. I'm worried about the. You know, how it's going to be received. So, um, what what I would recommend for for onboarding um, when we when we visit somewhere, we never get into arrivals and see a mirror on the wall that explains all the values, norms, and context of that culture and what's expected. Same thing's true when we go to a new workplace, right? It's often the informal, um, the informal aspects that that we need support with, and I think that that's something that I would focus on with the onboarding is helping people understand. Um, more of those nuances and informal elements of culture. So whether those are things that relate to, you know, what's expected of, of people within a particular department or workplace. Um, sometimes that might be related to, you know, things like workplace behaviors or workplace culture, other things like that. But I think I would I would recommend integrating it within orientation and involving different people within the orientation processes. So as I said in the recommendations, I really like the idea of I'm, and I'm a proponent for team based mentorship. Um, I think that there's a great opportunity there to build internal leadership competencies within the organization and also help ensure that people um, in the early parts of their onboarding and orientation are being socially supported. And I think that those social support aspects that reinforce informal learning. So, for example, being able to ask, I saw this happen earlier today um within this you know on the elevator or, or the boardroom or this what does it mean right i'm i'm less likely going to ask my supervisor to explain that but i'm more likely and more inclined to feel comfortable asking my colleague brian that works in a parallel position to me or has been at the organization for a few years um and has you know volunteered to maybe be my buddy mentor whatever it is you want to characterize or classify that as um, so that's that I think that I think that would work extremely well and there's evidence to support that working well. Of course, you still need to have structured onboarding. There's certain things that you still need people to understand really clearly. Um, so I would say also having more regular check-ins. Um, onboarding can sometimes occur as a one and done deal. And we see this with education, you know, we talk about this with orientation. You're not going to remember a quarter of the things you hear in orientation. You're you're overwhelmed and inundated with information. So that needs to happen multiple times and in stages. And I think the same would be true of onboarding, that it should happen more than just once. There should be more intentionality to that rollout. Right. I love that idea. And I'm also really intrigued about exploring the options of team-based mentoring. Um, it makes so much sense especially when I reflect on even my experiences with having international students or, or um, newcomers coming into the workplace. They do tend, those especially come from the collectivist cultures, there is that safety in numbers sense of that they feel less exposed, they feel less like they're under a microscope. And I also loved your observation about intentionality of being very intentional, of explaining it's okay for you to ask a question. This isn't a trick. Um, because I remember thinking when I first heard this, I was like, well, does this really happen? So I actually asked some of my students who came from very collectivist cultures um, what an example of that would be like. They were like, oh, absolutely. And one student had shared an example that was from one of their professors, their first day of university. And they were studying something and there was like five possible options. And the professor had said, write a paper about what option you would choose and why. And the correct course was them to write about every single option and then to explore every single option and to provide a rationale on what they would do based on their supervisor's direction. Right. Whereas, you know, from a 
individualistic culture, the expectation would be choose one of the five, don't choose right. all five, and then you tell me why you chose it. And so that implicitness, I, I love that you brought that forward. One question that has come forward for you, Brian, is saying, thank you so much. Many systems need to be addressed to enhance the um, our ability to meet newcomers' needs. What would you say are the top three highest impact priorities to get started? So as an employer, right? Out of all of these, what would be the top three? You know, in individualistic cultures, we love, you know, not bringing this down to one or two action items. What would yeah. be your experience? Yeah, they yeah, it's a great question. Um, as an organization, um, I would say, you know, maybe begin with a with with an internal audit. Um, where are your blind spots? Or, you know, just just even if that's just just um, ask, answering the question of how are we doing things currently. Um, whether that's recruitment, orientation, onboarding, um, staff development, mentorship, all of those other aspects. So, what are we doing right now? Um, how are we doing it right now? Look at that just from an from an audit based perspective. Um, are we integrating intercultural training um, in different levels of our organization? Are we bringing forward those? Um, opportunities to strengthen our own internal knowledge and practices that are rooted in, you know, strengthening and providing our existing staff um, and, you know, future staff with um, additional insights, um, learning and development opportunities to strengthen intercultural skills. That would be my second. Um, and then, yeah, the, the third, I would think, is really just around culture. So organizational development takes time, um, right? It, you know, it, I think on average, you're looking at about three to five years to even make a shift in culture to an organization. So be intentional, know that it's going to take time and start integrating practices that are rooted around inclusivity, um, equity, uh, and providing um, strong support systems. Uh, I, 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 you know, I come back time and time again to that idea and aspect that we learn so much more effectively informally. Um, because when we're having, you know, when we're skating with our friend and fumbling or going for a walk and having coffee, whether that's with a coworker or a colleague or a friend, it's a lot easier to ask those questions. You know, I observed this or this happened today. Can you explain that to me? Or, you know, just through natural conversation, we learn those. So I would be in the third one I would say is I would be intentional about creating an inclusive and supportive culture within the organization. That can be done in many ways. It can be done through mentorship, team-based mentorship. It can be done through establishing committees. Um, some organizations I know are starting to look at culture days, you know, things where they recognize and celebrate different cultures. And sometimes, you know, whether that's done through food, which is always a, you know, a crowd pleaser, um, and then information sharing. There's a lot of little things, um, but having those little rec recreational and, and, and team building things happen organically and naturally and be embedded and supported within the organization are also proven to be really effective. Awesome. Doris, I also uh, have a question. I, I, I see that there's a question um, in the chat, so I know yes. we're on time, but I'll, so, I'll connect with you, Doris. Yeah, okay. I was just going to say there is one about how we learn more about team based mentorship. Yeah, so. connect with me. Um, you know, the, my my contact information is here. Call or email me. I'm happy to have a discussion. Um, you know, whether that's sharing a few tips, I have a, I have resources I could share. So depending on what you're looking for, I can help you put together something that's very structured and methodical, or just some suggestions. We also do have another 15 minutes, so there's no rush. Oh, you can okay. I thought that. we were done at one, so this is great. Okay. We can we can push a little. We can push okay. it, so. Great. Uh, okay, well, then I guess I'll answer that in more detail. Um, so how can we, what was the question? How, learning more, oh, yeah, we to learn more about it. Um, yeah, so learning more about it, I think, you know, as a general statement, um, reach out to me and, and we can talk more about your specific needs. There, there's things that we can look at that are structural, so, or more structured. So we could, you know, for example, things to start doing from a checklist perspective of what to do before you recruit, before you hire, before you onboard, what can be embedded within that orientation and onboarding, 
how does that look? How does that unfold? And then of course, checking in after to see, are you meeting those objectives? Um, Coming up with objectives and you know KPIs are also really important because as I established, there's a lot of ways that organizations can benefit benefit through team-based mentorship models, not just in supporting inclusive cultures um, for newcomers to the organization, but really in establishing those those leadership competencies for workforce development, which I think is is top of mind for a lot of people right now um, with the number of people that are expected to retire and, and leave the workforce within the next uh, little while. So how do we capture and pass on that knowledge as well could be integrated within that? Absolutely. I reflect on some of the exposures I had to, you know, small group uh, mentorships where we had um, them going both ways. So for those who are coming from um, born and bred within, say, a Canadian system where there's educational workforce, getting exposure to those collectivist uh, international norms make it more effective because as we go out into our workplace, we're integrating and interacting with our client base from all around the world and all across the city, and we need to be aware of that. And I think in the spirit of reconciliation as well, it's very important for us to remember that most Indigenous communities are collectivist cultures. So even when it comes to looking at truth and reconciliation, a lot of the misunderstandings, I think, and the miscommunications that may happen when you're looking at coming from rural to urban centers is also about that collectivist, individualistic culture, right? Um, when you had talked about over-explaining, I was laughing because I remember how frustrating that was for me as an instructor where mm -hmm. we would have to have, you know, or even support staff. You have 15 minutes, you have 20 minutes to each person. We realized quickly that's not going to work because sometimes it took me 10 minutes to get to the question. It was like there was this big, huge, long backstory. And yeah. it really did frustrate me for a while because, again, I thought, are they not prepared? Do they not understand what's going on? Right. And it was actually by sitting down in a one-on-one -on -one environment with some of the internationally educated staff saying, hey, what's going on think? And they're like, well, it could be this. And like, no, you'd have to have a really good reason to approach someone. So you preface that interruption of like, this is everything I've done. This yeah. is all the reasons I'm bringing everything to you so you know that I'm not just being rude and dropping in on it. I was like, oh, bingo made so much sense yeah yeah and yeah that that came up right that that's quite common um it's it's nice to hear that validated of course um but yeah i think i think like i said most of the time whether it's whether it's looking at workplace incidents that are being investigated or reported or looking educationally at some you know where there's some of those gaps a lot of the time it's it comes down to culture um and it comes down to cultural differences and whether we're bringing that back to um, mentorship or staff development or orientation is really just understanding that it's a process um personally and you know professionally i know that there's been times where i've learned that one of one of the things that I'm more open to and aware of now is recognizing that that process takes time and we, we're not necessarily going to be able to expect those results to happen within a few weeks or a few months that could be right. something that develops over years but when it does you're going to get you know the end product is these amazing employees that are both you know extremely appreciative of the supports um but also extremely effective and open up a number of market opportunities and just ways of doing ways of working whether those are supported through global perspectives and insights or you know cultural differences and uniqueness in terms of ways of thinking and problem solving and doing things and adding to the richness of that organizational fiber I wanted Absolutely. to come back to something you spoke about in terms of reconciliation, which I think you're spot on with that that connection to that collective orientation. Um, uh, and that is that when we look at the data, particularly within Canada, but it's Canada's not unique in this. It's pretty much a Western phenomenon. Um, over the past 30 years, employers and industry have increasingly been sounding the alarm on a skills deficit. And when you really look into that, the skills deficit is their soft skills primarily. 
um, right? And those are some, there's sometimes that deficit between graduates and new hires and new employees. So we often expect as organizations, leaders and hiring managers that newcomers coming into our organizations are gonna have that cultural context that, that be, be situated to understand everything um, mm -hmm. in terms of those informal, you know, those informal cultural systems that are in place and well-established. And as we talked about, unfortunately, in many cases, you know, have very, very deep roots that are embedded within colonial systems and yes. structures. And I think part of that is uh, acknowledging that there needs to be some deconstruction. Um, yep. You know, we need to, first of all, recognize that the ways in which we work, the ways in which we screen candidates, the ways in which we, you know, manage performance, all of those um, ultimately are connected to a colonial past and colonial systems. And I think that it is important to take a little bit of time to deconstruct them. Um, and if you put in the time to think about how do we do things so that they're a little more interculturally inclusive and rooted within intercultural development? Um, I think well, you know, both our both our organizations as well as um, members within those organizations, um, current and future, will be the better for it. Absolutely, you know, and when we talk about the global community and we talk about interactions and interconnections, one of the implicit awarenesses of that is that this is a multi-way communication street. This is no longer a process of you need to adapt to us. It's we need to adapt to each other. We need to adapt to the context and to the environment. And um, as you identified, sometimes our systems are not as flexible as they need to be currently, right? Um, they worked very well 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, but that world no longer exists. We do have one more question that has come up that we will bring forward to you is, have you studied the impact on international students learning in a virtual or online environment? And do you have any insights to share about some of the unique challenges or championships that may happen in that environment? And that will be um, our last question for today. Yeah, great question. So I I, pers I I haven't personally led a project, but I've reviewed projects as part of my literature review and, and background for this study um, that look at that question. And, and what we find, um, again, the, there are clear reflections to the power distance dimension and individualism, collectivism. So what a lot of students have reported when it comes to online learning and online environments is for lack of a better word, maybe how bold and borderline rude Canadian students can be in expressing their thoughts in online forums. Um, so when you come from a collectivist culture, there's a value system that's focused on group harmony. And that group harmony and group wellness is placed above individual expression in terms of values and social norms. So therefore, if you're asked to post an opinion in an online forum, what tends to happen is people will often wait to see what other people are posting, what the general flow of that conversation or the construction of ideas is until they weigh in and add ideas. And those ideas are more commonly going to be complementary ideas versus ideas that conflict or challenge those of other people. So even if I'm an international student or a newcomer from a more collective culture and I'm posting something in an open discussion forum, I'm less likely to share what is my what is my you know first impulse or thought on something, particularly if I disagree with content, I'm more likely to look at what other people are saying, find the points within those and validate that through my own expression and hold my conflicting views to myself. That being said, there is some research that does support and suggest that in general, international students especially are quite capable of adapting to understanding and understanding um, the cultural context, norms and values of their study, their, their new culture or you know, the place where they're studying abroad, but it does take time. And what concerns me within post-secondary education, and this also applies to workplaces, is that I work in the college sector, which means that most of our programs are either one-year certificate or postgraduate programs or two-year diploma programs. When I contrast that to universities that have four or five-year undergraduate degrees, what that really means is that those students have four or five years of informal learning, 
my students have two. So I really want to ensure we're being intentional about embedding additional information, additional learning and additional supports to help elevate those students and, and get them ready. But yeah, absolutely. we see that a lot in uh, in online. So that's a really good question. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that often happens in individualistic cultures like our own is that we underestimate the importance of group harmony and how that resonates deeply with everyone. And it reminded me of an experience I had decades ago, um, working in a collectivist culture in, in another country, and was staying with a family who were um, the top of the hierarchy. They were a very influential family, intergenerationally, um, deeply respected, very influential, big employers in the area. And um, through some situations, my drive to the airport had been delayed, so I was missed my plane. I was very worried about this, right? So when I get to the airport, I'm rushed through security, and this is way back in the day when you could, lots of people could go, right? So the family is walking me through security. All the gates are opening. I get to the tarmac, and the plane had been held for me. And what had happened was that the, um, the head of the family, when they had known my concern, had got the chauffeur to phone ahead to the director of the airport, and they had held the plane for me. And of course, I'm like, oh my gosh, thinking that I'm going to be like the most hated person on the plane when I get on because everyone's going to be frustrated that their flight was delayed because of me. When I got on, everybody was clapping. They were so happy that I made it. And I was just stunned at the genuine goodwill of all of these people who were so happy to be able to do this for this guest, for this stranger, for this friend of this very important family. And it was just a real reminder to me about how important that collectivist harmony were, was, right? That, you know, they were all just like, yay, you're here, we did it. And, you know, as the plane took off, I remember saying to one of the people, I'm like, oh, aren't you upset about this? And she was like, well, why? I'm like, well, the flight's delayed. And she said, the name of the city that we're going to, she said, the city isn't going anywhere. She said, it will be there when we land. And I just was like, you're absolutely right. You know, how hung up sometimes we get about time in individualistic yeah. cultures. And I think, you know, we do want to honor the time that we're coming to. So we're near the end of our time here. But I thank you again, Brian, for the wealth of information that you were able to share, the pace of the information. And I feel like this might be something we definitely maybe want to have you back in the future for another conversation about this specifically for those employers who are looking at taking on um, new hires or people who are coming to us from other geographic regions and also in terms of, you know, that spirit of reconciliation. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. I want to thank everybody who joined us online for this um, first presentation of the 2024 Speaker Action and Awareness Series that is hosted by the Equity Office in collaboration with the Human Rights Committee um, Council for the City of Winnipeg. Thank you very much. Brian is available. I encourage everyone to check out his profile on LinkedIn. Um, wealth of opportunity. Have yourselves a great day and we will connect with you the next time as well. And if any of you have any questions about the City of Winnipeg and the work that we are doing for our city employees, feel free to email us at edi at winnipeg.ca and we will triage your question appropriately. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye.